Make sure you like so you can go in. Yes. Thank you all for joining. We're just wait. Sorry, we had a couple of technical problems just getting started. We're just waiting for everyone to join, and we'll begin in a minute. Um, so we'll just give everybody a moment to enter the the webinar. Let me start. Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to today's uh, panel discussion. My name is Mekla Krishnamurthy. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research, where I also direct the State Capacity Initiative. And it's a huge pleasure and privilege for me to be able to moderate uh, a really wonderful, timely, and important discussion uh, today on India's new welfareism on subnational regimes and state capacity. Um, the State Capacity Initiative um, at CPR is an interdisciplinary research and practice program just focused on addressing the challenges of the Indian state in the 21st century. We sometimes say the 21st century Indian state, but then it sounds like it's a technology state. Uh, and uh, it's not, it's about the state, some of which is uh, quite nuts and boltsy uh, and full of people. And so it's an initiative that really focuses on the people of the state on critical transversal processes of governance uh, and on public institutions um, and, and look at how all of this is related in the context of um, sectors and at all levels of Indian democracy and federalism. Um, a lot of times, I think when we have conversations about state capacity in India, we start with, uh, you know, if only then, if only India was less federal, less diverse, less complex, less large scale. Uh, but I think, you know, this is an initiative which at most we can start with in spite, despite, uh, and think about how does one, you know, really confront and face the challenges of building state capacity in a democratic and federal uh, India. So for, the, you know, and for this reason, I'm actually really delighted to have an opportunity to uh, convene and put together this panel. Of course, for those of you who have been following CPR's work, we don't really need an excuse or an occasion to talk about federalism uh, or to talk about welfare. Uh, but the particular occasion for this uh, panel is a series of really you know, interesting papers that have just been published uh, in, the, in the latest issue of Territory, Politics, and Governance uh, by uh, three authors who are here today, Louise Tillin, Roger Jeffrey, and Ashwini Kumar. Uh, and each of the papers pick up um, extremely interesting and important aspects of thinking about and rethinking uh, our frameworks um, for understanding India's diverse uh, welfare regimes. Uh, and thinking about the politics of this particular moment. Uh, so, you know, Louise's paper takes up this question of, you know, does India have subnational welfare regimes and the role of state governments in shaping policy? Uh, Roger Jeffrey's um, paper looks particularly at health policy and federalism in India. Uh, and then Ashwini Kumar looks at uh, in a paper called Wages of Politics or Last Mile Welfare, which looks at the case of uh, MGNREGA, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, and its implementation on the ground, looking at frontline workers and last mile bureaucrats and state capacity. Um, you know, the title of the panel is India's new uh, welfare uh, you know, we've titled it to think about India's new welfareism, but the papers themselves look particularly at the last decade prior to this, you know, the, the first um, uh, BJP regime in 2014 at this time, right? So it looks at the period from 2004 to 2014. Uh, and I think we will discuss where we are today and where we go from here. But I think it's really um, useful and important for us to step back and look at this period uh, you know, in, in context. And so we'll, we'll structure the conversation as follows. Uh, each of the authors and, and panelists will take 10 minutes to share the key insights and arguments from their papers. Uh, and then we'll have a conversation amongst the panelists to kind of expand on their comments and also to pick up themes uh, that they've all raised um, and a conversation. And then of course, we'll be very, very happy to take questions from all of you. So please use the chat box um, 
to ask your questions and we'll try and weave them in as much as we can into the conversation. So feel free to post them uh, as we as we go along. Um, so let's begin. I won't take, we started a few minutes late and I don't uh, want to take up more time. We'll start, uh, Louise, with your work. And one of the things the State Capacity Initiative is always trying to do is come up with analytical frameworks and really think about how to frame the questions of state capacity. And I think you've spent uh, more time than most really over the last decade thinking about how to frame the you know, comparative uh, study and understanding of welfare regimes. So it'll be great uh, you know, to share how you're thinking also about these frameworks has evolved uh, and, and what you think about subnational welfare regimes at this point, uh, and I'm sure with much more to come. So over to you. Thank you, uh, Mekula, very much. Uh, firstly, for convening this panel. It's lovely to have the opportunity to talk about this, this paper, but also to hear from Ashwani and, and, from, uh, and from Roger as well, um, and to link it into the very exciting work that you're doing at the State Capacity Initiative. Um, so the paper I'm going to talk about doesn't directly focus on state capacity, but I think it raises some implications for how we see state capacity at the subnational level. I'm going to share my screen, I think, because this is a relatively data kind of framework heavy paper. I think it's the easiest way to talk through it. Um, so let me just uh, do that. And hopefully you can now see uh, the slides. Um, I can't control them for some reason. There we go. So the paper, um, which has just come out in territory politics governance, um, asks a fairly intuitive, simple question, which is whether it is possible to identify distinctive subnational welfare regimes in India. So it looks for patterns among states that are indicative of policy choices. Um, so purposive differences in the content of their social policy mix. Um, so it moves away from earlier exercises that have sought to explain variation in level in, in the performance of anti-poverty programs or of, of different kinds of welfare programs to try and look at the composition of the welfare mix across states and to see whether there are distinctive clusters of states doing relatively similar or different things um, in terms of social policy. Uh, and it focuses for this purpose on the second term of the UPA government or on data from the second term of the UPA government. Much of what I'm talking about are you know, areas of policy that have fairly long time lags, but the data comes from the second term of the UPA government. Um, uh, of course, also a period um, in which states had greater political and to an extent fiscal autonomy to design their own policy regimes. And I say that up front because it obviously has some implications for thinking about uh, the, the takeaways for the current period in which the autonomy of states to design and finance their own policy regimes has come under greater pressure. So the, the paper is really situated in this period of greater state level autonomy. And it seeks to build um, a framework to uh, assess the content of the welfare mix at the subnational level, building on a vast literature on welfare regimes, which has largely been focused on explaining cross-national variation. Much of that historically was focused on cross-national variation in advanced industrial contexts in the kind of post Second World War phase of welfare state construction in Europe and to an extent in, in North America. But there's a wide, more recent literature was, which has sought to trace patterns across lower and middle income countries, um, which has, I think, fairly conclusively suggested that there are distinctive patterns of welfare provision um, in, these con in, in these contexts, even in scenarios of greater labour informality where the relationships between states, uh, markets and family uh, as welfare providers look necessarily different um, to more advanced industrial contexts. Um, and I draw on a couple of 
heuristics that have been used in this literature to try and to, to, to uh, select the indicators that I use to analyze in the Indian context. Uh, one of the um, kind of contrasts that's often made in the cross-national literature are between welfare regimes in industrializing contexts that have focused on productivist approaches to social policy, so policies that promote human capital formation via public investment in health and education, as opposed to investment in worker protections and social insurance or social protection. And that kind of thrust in which is often identified in East Asian welfare regimes has often been contrasted with more of the more protectivist approach, which is focused more on public sector employment and the protection of workers. And, and some of this cross, na cross national literature, India has historically been identified slightly incorrectly, I would argue, as a protectivist, um, uh, having a, a protectivist approach to its social policy. Um, all of this cross-national literature to date has focused more on employment-based social insurance schemes in, in the formal sector, um, and it has only really recently started to engage with the much wider range of social assistance that we have seen in, in most lower and middle income countries in the last 20 years or so. So in this paper, I bring in both a focus on social insurance, well, formal categories of, of um, labour market participation and the kinds of social insurance that go with that, as well as um, social assistance. I also try to bring in, although the data here is more limited, um, the role of families and of women as caregivers as part of the welfare mix. Um, so I engage the, the, the idea that, that welfare regimes also need to be understood, um, not only through the extent to which they protect uh, people from reliance on, on labour markets, uh, but also um, the extent, extent to which they engage in defamiliarisation. Um, so enabling female participation in labour markets. Um, so the, the framework I build is, you know, takes these two main concepts, de-commodification or commodification, so the extent to which people rely uh, on, you know, uh, primarily on their ability to uh, participate in labour markets uh, with or without social protection um, and uh, the, the nature of defamiliarisation. And I, of course, take these down to the subnational level. Um, this slide just sets out the indicators that I use to categorize state level regimes. Um, so in order to assess the degree of decommodification that is taking place, I look at both the extent of total labor force participation, so the, you know, the vitality of labor markets full stop. Um, I look at measures of, of uh, self-employment and, and, and uh, the proportion of the workforce that's salaried, so to get a measure of informality in the labor market, um, and you know, the higher the proportion of the workforce that is self-employed, the, the, the higher the level of commodifying bent um, that, that I would identify in, in a state, and I also have you know, controls on, on um, overall levels of social, social and economic development. Um, in the social assistance or social policy set of indicators, I use primarily data on, on access and, and the degree of universalization in the PDS, um, the uh, reliance on uh, Narega, um, and I also have data on total social sector expenditure, total public expenditure to, to get a measure of the extent to which a state relies more heavily on public sector employment, which would, which would indicate a more protectivist kind of approach to, to social policy and a measure of private school enrollment, another indicator of the level of commodification. Um, Defamiliarisation, the indicators are fairly limited. Um, so the main uh, indicator that is important is the proportion, proportion of women in reproductive years who are workers. Uh, but I also have measures of the population under 14 and over 60 to get a sense of the extent of the caring burden um, in a state. So the demographic profile of a state likely matters here too. And then I have two, two, two measures of welfare outcomes as well. Um, and I um, undertake a cluster analysis, which is a method which looks for similarities um, in cases um, across the range of indicators um, and organizes states, you know, it, it, or cases, the case, states in this case, other cases, organizes cases in terms of their proximity across these uh, mix of indicators. 
Um, and this little tree diagram on the left hand side of this slide uh, provides you a snapshot of the clustering of states according to these variables. Um, and the table on the right is my analysis of the clusters that um, emerge from the analysis. Um, so states, I think, do cluster in quite meaningful ways, um, which, you know, uh, uh, kind of supports my intuition that it is possible to identify something which looks like a subnational welfare regime in India. The first, the top cluster of states um, are all, um, you know, richer states. So I think that's, you know, these are all states with a higher level of, of per capita income and lower levels of poverty. Um, and overall, um, they see higher levels of labour market formalisation um, and they have a fairly similar demographic profile, so a similar proportion of the population over 60 and under 14. But despite those commonalities, they have they cluster in two quite distinctive sets. Um, the first set, cluster 1A, um, are those that I describe as being decommodifying and familial um, in their welfare mix. Um, and in some ways, this might be the most surprising cluster of states um, because it brings together, of course, Kerala and Uttarakhand, which are well known for having, you know, historically a more social democratic approach to, to wealth, welfare provision, along with Maharashtra and Haryana, which we might have might expect to uh, look rather different. These states, though, do share some important commonalities. So they have the lowest levels of overall labour force participation in the whole of the data set um, and the smallest proportion of women in reproductive years in the workforce. Um, they uh, have, uh, like all of the state, states in, cluster, in the first cluster, they have high expenditure on public sector employment uh, and they have the highest social expenditure per capita. Um, and there's some variation in terms of their reliance on social assistance. So as you would expect, Kerala and Uttarakhand do a lot better on the social assistance variables on PDS and Narega provision than, um, than Maharashtra and Haryana. But overall, these are states which rely more on salaried and public sector employment, have a lower overall level of workforce participation and a lower level of female labour force participation um, than, uh, than other states. The second of the, the subclusters in cluster 1B are um, one, one of the two clusters which I would suggest is, are becoming a modal subnational welfare regime in India. And I describe this modal um, welfare regime as commodifying with protection. Um, so these uh, states have a higher level of overall labor market participation than cluster 1A. Um, but they supplement that more pro-market approach to reliance on labour markets with publicly financed social assistance. Um, so they overall, this cluster 1B, have the highest overall levels of labour force participation, including female labour force participation of any states. Uh, they collectively have the highest levels of PDS and Narega coverage. And only Punjab and Gujarat stand out slightly there for having weaker um, PDS and Narega coverage. Um, and those states might, might, it might be slightly anomalous here as well. Maybe better seen just as straight commodifying states without strong social safety nets. The second cluster of states collectively, of course, are on the whole poorer. Um, but they show quite clear distinctions in the two subclusters, which I think are also quite telling. And this is where questions of state capacity and the ability to turn around state administrative capacity um, might become important. So the, the cluster 2A here, I would suggest share characteristics with 1B in that they are commodifying, they have a, a um, they have a high, higher level of labour market informality than the first class, than the states in the first cluster, but um, overall high levels of labour market participation, which are combined with um, reasonably effective social assistance provision. So this cluster of states perform at about the national average for um, uh, PDS and Narega, um, and they have the highest proportion of women in the workforce of all states as well. Um, 
And then the, the, the final cluster are those which I describe as commodifying insecure. So these are states with very high levels of self-employment, very low levels of, of, uh, of um, a very low proportion of salaried workforce. Um, they are considerably below the national average when we look at both social sector expenditure and performance of these major social assistance schemes. So they really are states in which we see very high levels of precarity, of dependence on informal labour markets without effective social safety nets. Um, so to conclude, um, I the, the, the paper, the analysis in the paper, um, I think, uh, suggests that a new modal welfare regime had emerged in India by the end of the UPA period in office, um, and that rather than consisting of a protective welfare regime that relies on you know, protecting individuals from reliance on labour markets, um, or an informal security regime where there simply is very low public commitment to welfare altogether, if we look at the subnational level um, at this disaggregated picture, we end up with a clearer sense of what the modal welfare regime is, you know, was evolving towards by 2014, and that is one that I suggest is commodifying, uh, but with protection. Um, and of course, you know, this challenges the earlier literature on subnational welfare regimes, which I think has focused heavily either on the Kerala model or on, you know, contexts in which, you know, there are more cohesive subnational political communities, thinking of the work of, of Prerna Singh. What I show here is that we can find this commodifying with protection model across a range of states which have very different regional party systems. Uh, they have different patterns of political alignment with the centre. Some are, you know, some some are some were governed by the UPA or uh, uh, coalition partners. Um, others were in opposition to the UPA, um, but that didn't seem to matter for the overall, you know, the commitment to a particular welfare model. Um, and these welfare regime choices are not simply a reflection of underlying state capacity. So we see similar states that may have made different choices in terms of their welfare. Uh, mix. Although, as I've said, that final cluster probably does tell us that state capacity still matters as well. Um, I mean, that's, I think that is without question. So I, I will leave it there and I'll look forward to, to talking further. Thanks so much, uh, Lisa. I think that's given us lots of questions actually to, to get into and, and uh, thrown up some really interesting um, insight as well as I think some things that we can try and unpack uh, in our conversation. Um, I know Roger Jeffrey in your paper you refer to Louise's work and to some of the, the, the framework that she's put out both now as she's developed it further and earlier um, but look at health and some uh, you know and you point out that often in discussions on welfare and particularly when we think about welfare regimes health hasn't actually featured as much in the analysis, which has looked at other kinds of schemes and programs. Uh, and in your paper, you take us through a longer history that's colonial to post-colonial and the transition, looking at the you know, institutional development of health and center state relations, uh, and then focus in on the NRHM as um, you know, uh, the National Rural Health Mission, this particular moment to understand uh, health programs and health systems as a site of contestation, particularly looking at the center state dynamics. I think given the moment we're in, the pandemic, everything that has happened with vaccines and the discussion that is happening around center state uh, and this particular moment as we look at what is happening in terms of centralization uh, and the debates around centralization and decentralization, uh, it's, it's great to have you um, with us to, to talk us through your paper. I'll turn over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mekala, and um, thank you again, as with Louise, for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity to hear what I think is, is some very interesting material from Louise, as well as I'm sure from Ashwani and others uh, present here. Um, maybe just to start with um, uh, several things. For, I didn't have access to Louise's paper when I was writing my paper. So insofar as I've used her work, which I think is exceptionally useful, I'm referring to an earlier paper of hers with others um, from about 2017 which has um, a different take, and I found a very useful take in terms of pacifying of states, in terms of a variety of 
aspects of their politics, very different from what you've just heard her talking about. So uh, I'm not going to try and um, relate what I did in the paper, but closely to what she's just talked about, um, because I think there are, there are quite considerable differences. But nonetheless, this effort at clustering to looking at, at similarities across states, uh, I think it is a very useful uh, approach. But I, I should also say that this is not something that I've done um, in the past very much in my own research. So you've just heard a, a you know a top of the top top rank political scientist um, approach to this kind of issue. I am more of an ethnographer in the past, and so my my interest in in health systems started by field work in uh, accident and emergency departments in Lahore rather a long time ago, um, probably well before most of you were born. Um, and then uh, looking at the politics of health in, in Delhi nationally, but also within, within different parts of, this, of, of India. And in 1981, I lived for, for more than a year in an operating theater in Western UP. And you heard me right. I did live in what was called the operating theater. Uh, and so my, my understanding of the day-to-day -day politics of health tends probably unreasonably to rely rather heavily on what it's like in Western UP in the 1980s and the 1990s. I went back another time and we lived in a postpartum center. We lived in the postpartum center. Neither of these buildings obviously being used for the purpose for which they had been built. So I do have Experience, personal experience from other parts of the country. I was involved in an aid project in, in Orissa, as it was then called, um, and began to see that UP wasn't typical of the whole country, that there were patterns of healthcare provision and the way in which politics, society, economy interacted to create a certain form of health service provision in UP that although some things were common, other things were very different in, in, in Orissa. Uh, and then uh, visiting in a variety of ways, health services elsewhere in the country. So sort of in the gut feeling I have about different parts of India, a lot of this is based on what I've seen for myself um, as a starting point, but obviously not an end point. And um, maybe just to say, in addition on this, that when I first went to some health centers uh, around about Hyderabad, I was shocked. There were these health centers in villages, people attending them, things going on. It really was a bit of a, a social center as well as a health center. The idea that that could be possible was not, um, was not acceptable to me from what I'd experienced in UP. So this sense of, of at the basic level, at the level of how it, people, indiv individuals and company and groups of uh, co you know, corporate groups of various kinds interact with health services, with public sector health services, is very much something that, that I felt um, on a personal basis. So I wanted to understand what these differences were and why they were continuing. And I think the um, as, as you've said, Mekula, the historical context is remarkably important in health. Uh, I'm not saying it's not important elsewhere as well. Um, and so if you look back at the path dependency issues, they certainly can be traced back to the colonial period. I'm not going to go into that. It's my earlier work was to try and understand the significance of the transition from colonial to independent status. Um, and I think the point I would make from that is that the path dependency was only somewhat interrupted by the chaotic con conditions within which that transition took place, at least in some parts of India. One significant feature is obviously the um, ending of the Indian Medical Service, the service that was supposed to apply within the sphere of public health, the same kind of centralizing at least um, organizing of local provincial level health services along lines that were common across the um, of British India. Uh, that element of central influence, um, it wasn't really control, but at least of a coming and going between state and centre um, was broken in 1948. And it was broken for, I think, rather 
um, uh, not, not, certainly not particularly strong reasons. So um, I think there was a political history of relationships between mostly British Indian Medical Service officers and their attitudes towards uh, indigenous medicine of various kinds that got up the noses of, of a large number of, of Congress politicians. So the care that's been available across India has varied dramatically from the colonial period and throughout independent India. And some of that can be seen uh, even today. I think if you look at, within Kerala, you'll see differences between what those parts that were used to be part of the Madras presidency and those that were in Travancore or Cochin. They're, they're, they're declining, they're not very significant, but I think it's for a long time been possible to see those kinds of differences. The point of the paper was to ask how do the positions of Indian states in terms of their approach to welfare state policies interact with center state relationships in health policy making. And um, I've been interested in that. My book from 1988 was um, very much concerned in part with the role of the Planning Commission and its attempts to influence state level policy making in health and how that basically becomes unravels over time, certainly was has now almost completely unraveled. Um, but in the period up to 2014, which is when the, the, the article ends, um, these efforts to integrate in some way state and central policy making were based under Nehruvian style approaches on the Central Council of Health and the Planning Commission. And the, by the end of, of 2014, I think both of those are really collapsed in, in all, to all intents and purposes. So that get, brings me on to the discussion of the National Rural Health Mission. And I think one of the things that, that again started me thinking about this was a conversation I had with Lincoln Chen, who was in the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation representative in Delhi uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And I met him in Delhi in 2006, I think. He was there to advise the UPA government on its new health policy proposals. And he said to me, what, what do we do? What should we do? And, and we agreed that if you put more money into the system and don't change anything else, then UP in particular will carry on spending its money in infruitful ways uh, and there won't be any change. There's no point just in a blank check to the state governments to spend more money on health because they won't know how to do it and they won't use it effectively. And of course, that was a very um, clear prediction of what might happen. And indeed it did, of course, as, as we know, there's a, a very substantial scam in public health in UP, uh, large sums of money from, from um, NRHM went missing and half a dozen senior health civil servants died. Uh, as a result of, of, of the kinds of, of things that were involved. So what is the distinctions between, what are the distinctions between states that help to explain why more money in UP or in Bihar or um, a number of other states is not likely to lead to benefits to the mass of the population, whereas smaller amounts of money spent by Tamil Nadu or by Kerala or even by Gujarat are likely to make a, a rather greater difference. Um, in health, but again, it's, it's, it's as you said, Mekala, this isn't something that is often recognized by people who don't work on health. The, the notion of the Bimaru states has been a well-established sense that Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Assam, Rajasthan and, and UP, and also the sub-states that came out of Madhya Pradesh and, um, and Bihar are areas where essentially politics, society, economy all come together to make health services very inefficient, in, unfruitful, and very hard to, to manage, to organize in a way that's, that's going to break out of that situation. So in the sense of inertia in the system, I was asking what in what circumstances change might be possible. What, what makes change possible? And I, not being a political scientist, um, chose one way of coming at this is a man called Kingdon, who talks about 
the need for problems, policies, and politics to come together. You have to agree that there is a problem and it has to be significant. You have to have some policies that might actually be available to be used. And you have to have a politics that says, these are issues that really come to the top of the political agenda. And that happened in at the central level in India around 2004, 2005, 2006. And that's what leads to the National Health Mission and a number of other, obviously, and Rager and so on, other innovations. It doesn't happen in any almost, I mean, it happens in almost no state that you get a similar coming together. And that's essentially the problem. What level, how do states who are formally constitutionally responsible for health, how can you get health policies that, that are fruitful in public health terms when health is such a low priority? Uh, in, it's not seen as a problem. It's medical care sometimes is, uh, but not public health. So I've been following what's been happening since the end of of, of the NIHM and under the, the most recent government. And I've tried to see, at least from a distance, what's been going on in India under COVID. I'm not in any sense competent to judge on those, but I think it's a very, very interesting example of, of the complexities of trying to find ways of bringing state and center together when the states do vary so to a tremendously in terms of their capacity but also in terms of these other variables, in terms of the politics, the absence of a politics of health, um, which makes energizing, recruiting, getting um, people working on health issues very difficult in some states and much easier elsewhere. So one of the things that Niti Aayog tried to do was a nudge politics, a health index that was going to be made public. And so states would say, finally would acknowledge that you know infant mortality rates were two three five times higher in your state than they were in in Kerala and that people might start to complain about this and do something about it and it's not happened the question is I suppose for the moment is is Covid that break is that is Covid the condition within which this kind of comparative health analysis becomes important for everyday politics. And I just leave that as a question. I don't have an answer. Thank you so much, um, Roger. We'll also come back because I think, you know, one of the things you look at in your paper is not only about the varied sources of influence, uh, you know, shaping the UPS policies, but the fact that the states were really represented in those central policy making moments and that although the NRHM represented this focus um, where the center thought about how it could really invest in strengthening state systems, particularly in context of great diversity and inequality and inequity, uh, in some ways the resistance to it, uh, it strengthened the fault line, not only in the resistance that states had to this kind of imposition, but also the deeper fault line between say directorates and departments and the creation of health societies that would then bypass the state and take you straight to the district. And so I think the mechanisms by which the center tries to do these kinds of maneuvers, um, you know, very important work when you do have so much inequality, uh, perhaps also exacerbated the kind of tensions. And that was a really important takeaway because I think you've got to this point where at least health was, it came up but then the story of NRHM was one where we saw uh, an exacerbation of an existing fault line um, rather than it opening up into a new kind of arrangement. And I think we're at this point where we now need to revisit these sectors and think about what would actually good institutional arrangements for federalism be. And we'll come back hopefully to that in the discussion. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, and so finally, we'll turn now to uh, the third paper um, and an author we have, uh, to discuss with us today, Ashwini Kumar, and your paper, you know, we've looked at frameworks and, and welfare regimes and subnational welfare regimes. We've then looked particularly at center state dynamics and institutions, um, but you take us to the front line, to that famous last mile, uh, and particularly to NREGA, uh, and uh, you, you look at the districts and, and try and 
give us a different sense of the site of contestation, that to understand differential effects and outcomes, we need to understand the relationships at the front line and particularly the diversity of the local bureaucracy at the front line. So over to you uh, to take us uh, through your paper. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mekla. Thank you, Mekla, for organizing this wonderful conversation, I would say, amongst us and also making it available to the public. You know. Thank you very much, Mekla. And also thank you, Rahul Verma at CPR, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, a special thanks goes to Rahul. Uh, you know, is part of our journey at TISS, part of my, you know, my own, my own journey in different roles. Uh, so thank you, Rahul, very much. And thank you, Yamni. It's, she has an, always been around. For me, coming back to CPR is like going home. So I'm back home. And it's like, you know, very Tagorean sense, you know, ghari and bahari. So when I'm out of CPR I, or out of Delhi, I feel like I'm in the world and back in Delhi, I'm back home. So on, on, on this note, uh, let me say a few words and then I will share the screen. Uh, the way I have looked at uh, NRGA, Narega, or Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, it has a causal framework. Uh, and I think, you know, leaning on Louis Tillin's work, uh, you know, Atul Kohli's work and uh, John Harris' work uh, and others, you know, various others' works. What I have done in my last mile welfare paper, uh, which is a part of my manuscript, you know, big manuscript. Uh, so I'm very uh, excited that, you know, this conversation uh, is going to be very productive and helpful for my big manuscript. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, NRGA and I'm uh, actually looking at welfare regime. And, and then correlating it with sub-national state capacity. So the link is there, you know, link is there. You know, I'm looking at, uh, you know, what people have referred to as emergent uh, rights-based architecture of welfare, you know, which is missing in our debate these days, you know, for the last several years, you know, especially since 2014, for a variety of reasons, I don't want to reflect on that, you know, what kind of ideological consistency contestations and political contestations and policy moves have happened since 2014. But since in the, in the air, there is no reference to rights-based architecture or welfare and its impact on the sub-national state capacity. So that's my framework. And then I will come back to, you know, um, districts also. And I keep reminding myself uh, is, uh, that in the last 10 years, how many districts I visited, how many states I visited. So just stay with me. And if I sound a little fragmented, you know, because of my, you know, whole day, you know, kind of administrative responsibility, a tiring responsibility, a last mile responsibility at my institute. So friends, uh, you know, let me, let me sh uh, share. I, uh, I'm not very technology savvy. But let me see if I'm able to share. Ah, here, here. Uh, there you go. Uh, Mikla, it's clear. Uh, you can see it. Yeah. It is. Yes, we can see it. Uh, so I have very limited time, and it's a very huge uh, story. So I will really be very brief here. So I will only present, uh, you know, theoretical claims, analytical side of the story, and and then you know uh, a sort of what I call photo memory. You know, a photographic memory of the districts and the state capacity or the last mile, you know, capacity. Uh, in various districts of the country, you know, especially six here, but in the big manuscript, I'm talking about, you know, many more districts. Yeah. So first, you know, let me, you know, share with you what kind of, uh, you know, claim uh, I'm making here, you know. Uh, my, my basically I'm looking at, uh, based on official statistics, it's a very hybrid methodology I'm using. A welfare registers and ethnographical material, you know, sort of, you know, stylized ethnographical material I'm presenting uh, for the sake of this discussion and this paper actually uh, is what uh, I would love to call it vignettes, you know, ethnographic vignettes. Uh, if you can look at uh, this way, because this is becoming far more popular in experimental political science these days. Uh, and I'm looking at, uh, you know, under what conditions uh, the capacity of the last mile matters for the performance of welfare programs. And that is where the story is unpacked or will be unpacked, the story of, you know, sub-national state capacity, you know. So I will focus on the state capacity very clearly when I'm talking about last mile bureaucracy. 
And what I do, uh, I'm making a huge claim here, you know, different from the conventional thesis in political science. I've been trained political science. My earlier work was on community warriors and, and, and private caste armies where I looked at, you know, collapse of the state, privatization of the state, you know, those typical, you know, issues in the literature uh, in political science on a state capacity, you know, and especially a strong autonomous state idea. What I'm suggesting here, looking at uh, the implementation by last mile officials and bureaucrats in various districts of the country, that it is not necessary, it is not necessary that uh, welfare is possible within the framework of a state, strong autonomous state. So that's the capacity issue here. And that is why I'm trying to shift attention to the understudied relationship between the capacity of the last mile bureaucracy and, and divergent divergent heterogeneous welfare outcomes in India, especially in the districts of India. These are some of my claims, you know, and I call it, you know, a sort of, you know, leaning on to Lewis' work, Tillin's work. And I picked up this idea from her work she has been doing for the last decade, you know, very interesting and exceptionally powerful work on clustering welfare regimes, you know, kind of changing the gauge, you know, completely shifting the gauge from Atul Kohli and John Harris uh, to new ways of looking at welfare regimes and sub national welfare regimes. So I call it, uh, you know, linking both uh, what I call polymor polymorphic welfare regimes, not in, in the sense of clustering welfare regimes, but polymorphic welfare regimes uh, at the individual level. And then variable state capacity, that's key for me to understanding uh, under what capacity is the uh, you know, last mile bureaucrats uh, or la local state, you know, which is very popular in the work of Akhil Gupta, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then I will examine how multiple welfare trajectories or polymorphic welfare regimes in the districts of India. So kind of, you know, taking, you know, insight of telling from the subnational state clusters, I'm going to the districts, you know, and I'm trying to hypothesize, is there any possibility of conceptualizing, which is a daunting task and a huge task, uh, and also hypothetical task of, you know, welfare regimes, you know, at the level of the districts, you know, is there any possibility of conceptualizing that? Thirdly, you know, more empirically oriented, empirically oriented issue I'm touching upon is why some districts in the United States have performed way better at implementing social welfare policy than others. You know. That's about, you know, examining the variations. And finally, you know, that insight I was sharing with Mekla, a tribute to the genius of Professor Rajni Kotari, going back to his 1970 seminal classic work, Politics in India, and picking up, you know, that insight from there, the whole idea of politicization of, you know, like social policy. So do differences in local political regimes and forms of association and politics influence heterogeneous welfare outcomes at the subnational level in India. That's that's my and my methods. You know, uh, you know, this is like uh, you know, I have looked at six districts, uh, and the paper is available. I would like everyone to, you know, pay a little close attention to the paper because that's uh, details are in the paper. You know, so today I will only present uh, a very stylized uh, uh, photo memory sort of stuff here. So I'm looking at you know six six states and six districts here, right? And the material that I have presented is here uh, has my personal story also, because um, as Mekla rightly pointed out, uh, uh, my paper also relates to 2009 to 2015. You know, this is UPA two part, uh, and since you know 2009, I have been very actively involved, you know, in the implementation of NRGA and various other rural development programs in the country, especially as a member of Central Employment Guarantee Council, then you know, heading a task force for capacity building reforms, and then various committees in rural development ministries, and also a committee which is very significant for my work was National Award for Effective Initiative under NRG administration. That is key to my work in terms of, you know, understanding how last mile bureaucrats and officials help implement various welfare programs and especially NRG. So uh, what I'm trying, my framework is here, you know, based on bringing together state and society. So that's kind of I'm looking at uh, and I'm trying to, you know, extend the argument that others have already done in the past uh, 
uh, you know, including Kohli, Tillin, and Prerna Singh, you know, so looked at subnational solidarity. So when I look at, you know, the way uh, last mile will, you know, bureaucrats implement energy in terms of, you know, state capacity or subnational state capacity, and at the district block and panchayat level, you know. So I'm trying to look at vari variable capacity, you know, rather than, you know, just a linear capacity, you know. If you look at the state literature, it's very, it gives a sense of transcendent reality. You know, state capacity is just one kind of stuff, you know. There is no variability here. So I'm looking at that. And my framework draws on Weberian, you know, it's a Weberian largely. And, uh, and then I'm attempting, you know, in terms of integrating Migdal's idea of integrated domination and dispersed domination. It's key to my understanding my, my ideas of state capacity at the district level. And there I make, make this claim here that neither a strong autonomous nor infrastructural enough you know, Those who have worked uh, and people like, you know, Mekla and, and her colleagues at CPR and Ayamani herself has worked uh, and published a very, very powerful paper, Post Office State, you know. That's, that's very interesting for me because uh, that really contests the idea of a strong autonomous state or a strong infrastructural state in various parts of the country. So what I'm trying to suggest here, then when I go to sharing, you know, share my, my ideas or, 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 the, or the details of, you know, how last mile officials implement energy, you could see that this is not very important to me, you know, that strong autonomous or a strong infrastructural state, you know. That I will skip that and come back to uh, how I look at you know this is here you can look at you know uh, 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 look at how I, I explain you know so I look at you know autonomy of last mile bureaucracy and then uh, its embeddedness and then I refer to Kotari's work you know the insight of politicization that politicization is I'm explaining in the districts and the blocks and the ground panchayats of India you know like you know it's just has imploded, you know, imploded in the last 10 years. And I would suggest here that part of it, you know, the, the whole process of, you know, uh, democratic process, process, uh, pressure from below is also an outcome, you know, it's also an outcome of emergent right based architecture, you know, this right bit architecture, because if you look at NRGA design, NRGA design also refers to, you know, RTI, you know, transparency, accountability, you know, and also, you know, also democratizing Gram Sabha, which historically had been redundant and dysfunctional. So a lot of things are happening here uh, when we are looking at uh, the realities of welfare implementation at the districts level, block levels, and, and the Gram Panchayat level. So this is the framework uh, of, you know, what I call autonomy of last mile bureaucracy and divergent welfare outcomes. Sir. Uh, I will skip, you know, uh, both NRGA design and also while last mile bureaucracy. I assume that we are familiar with, you know, NRGA design and also, you know, the whole conceptualization of last mile bureaucracy. Uh, the capacity and autonomy of last mile bureaucracy. Uh, this is also something quite interesting here, uh, because uh, if you look at, you know, uh, uh, you know, Taylor's own work, you know, especially quite interesting work is chief minister's office, you know, the role of chief ministers. So uh, when I go to the districts or panchayat level or block level, uh, I don't find, you know, uh, CM office available there or present there or omnipresent omni there. So uh, that you can see when you read that, you know, detailed paper, you will find how, you know, uh, how block officers, uh, how panchayat officers are implementing in their own framework, you know, in their own, uh, and this is where their own cognitive maps are important. Uh, this is where their own kind of, you know, discretionary, uh, you know, ideas are important. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to suggest here that uh, there's something here missing, you know, uh, if you look at uh, what I'm trying to say that uh, the relationship between redistributional struggles, you know, which I call uh, wages of politics, uh, by grassroots civil civil society organization and local bureaucracy. You know. In some cases, my claim is based on district level analysis, and uh, you know, through both uh, you know quantitative analysis and also ethnographic analysis. What I'm suggesting that you know it leads to a more responsive bureaucracy, welfare bureaucracy. 
if not on the whole bureaucracy, but at least a part of the bureaucracy in the district level or at the at the block level and the panchayat level. And, and th this, this results into a more effective implementation of welfare programs, not all welfare programs, at least energy, at least, you know, flagship program. So in, in other words, what I'm trying to suggest uh, that capacity and autonomy of the local state in the Indian context needs to be reconceptualized, you know, from bottom up rather than top down. That's my claim. So this is the way I have looked at, uh, you know, Jalpai Guri, Bagalkot, Karnataka, Tiruvannamalai, Sioni, Nagor, Gaya, you know, and based on, uh, you know, while I was working in different committees, you know, and creating a sort of what I called those days from 9 to 14, equity index, you know, equity index, uh, uh, based on equity index, uh, we used to select districts uh, for their nomination for the best, uh, you know, administrative district uh, implementing NRG. So look at you know performance in participation of women, SCST, and also average days of you know Narega implementation, you know, average days of work in NRGA. So these are some of the well-known variables of you know tracking and measuring NRGA performance in the districts, blocks, and panchayat level. Uh, so so here is uh, you know like uh, um, Jalpai Guri. So I will be very brief, Mekala, because you know lots of stuff are there. And uh, I want to leave some some space for discussion and conversation, and also for you know uh, you know mom, far more interactive you know process of understanding each other's paper too, so that they fit into each other's understanding. So uh, interesting is Jalpai Guri, you know. Interesting is Jalpai Guri because uh, if you look at Jalpai Guri, it's a place where uh, you know the livelihood crisis of tea garden laborers, you know. And uh, very briefly, I would touch on this. Because the right to food campaign was very active, you know. When I personally visited the site, you know, as part of, you know, exercise to see what's happening in Jalpaiguri, why Jalpaiguri is becoming innovative practice, you know. And this innovative practice, I credit to the local officers, you know. Because you see that NRG design, and especially what we used to call the first NRG, not NRG one rather than NRG two. In NRG, first, there was no provision for extension of the implementation to this, you know, tea garden, tea garden. So that's very important, you know, how local officials about whom we have always been suggesting that, you know, they are, they are inefficient, uh, they have no imagination, they suffer from capability trips. We are all aware of these frameworks of, you know, looking at look, last mile well, uh, officials and uh, last mile bureaucrats. But here, what's happening that it was their own innovation, you know, it was their own kind of whatever could be the reason, but the big reason was the active, uh, you know, active presence of right to food campaign, you know, the, the, the petition to the Supreme Court uh, and also the trade unions, you know. So there, what I said earlier, you know, we have to look at, you know, associational capacity, you know. We have always looked at the state capacity separately, you know, without looking into the associational capacity. So I'm linking here. And then when we went there, assessed it, uh, spent the time, and, and then we realized that, you know, if you look at Kohli's literature, you know, uh, that's that social democratic regime. And when you go to the, you know, like plantation side of West Bengal, and here particularly Jalpai Guri, you find that by the time 2010 and 11, nine and 10, when we visited, uh, social democratic regime was very fragile here. The welfare outcomes were very poor here. Nothing was happening, you know. And in this context, NRGA, the very presence of NRGA, gave a new, new sense of energy, enthusiasm, and built new capacity at the subnational level, you know, at the district level. And that that led to the extension of, you know, extension of NRGA to the plantation, tea gardens. Uh, that also led to, you know, led to the effort of mitigating food crisis there in, in the district. And this is, this is also related to the civil society, you know, efforts there. So this is like, you know, a very successful case. Just, just, I know I'm, I'm, I'm 
make learn. Actually, I know you have so much. Uh, yeah, so very briefly. So many I'm, I'm just, just give me. You can take another minute or two. Another and minute, make learn coming. I'm too much, you know, too much stuff here. I'm sorry because no, 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 no like problem. The, we can come back to yeah. some of this in the. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. What I'm going to do that Tirumannal, Tiruvannamalai. You know, if you look at the literature, you know. But here, what I find, uh, it, it, rather than rather than looking at you know subnational solidarity, subnational solidarity. You know, the key to understanding, you know, the empowerment of labor, uh, you know, here in the context of NRG is so rather how, how the last mile welfare, uh, you know, happened here, you know, largely due to the, the way, you know, last mile officials, you know, committed themselves to implementing, implementing NRG, given the, given the historical background of, you know, you know, welfare regime in the state. And there is again, you know, dispersed. You know. Bagalkot, Bagalkot case is a very dysfunctional case, a case that we know in the literature, a tale of bureaucratic and political capture. You know. The interesting thing, thing, thing about my district stories that every district you would find that there is a very, you know, like modest number of works done, but the works done in a, in a peculiar political environment, especially in Bagalkot, where, where politicians captured it for the narrow partisan or what we call clientelistic purposes, you know. So here, NRG, despite performance, uh, good performance, modest performance, was clientelistically captured, you know. That's the, that's the bagel code. And, uh, and CUNY districts, you know, tribal districts, again, a case of, uh, you know, uh, clientelistic capture, and, uh, you know, despite the efforts by last mile officers to extend the, extend the, very net of NRGA and build capacity. Make my, 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 what I'm suggesting that in each district, even in the clientelistic district, there is improvement over the available state capacity, subnational capacity. That's important. And uh, Nagar districts, you know, you know Rajasthan. We all know Rajasthan uh, is a very good, you know, like at the subnational level. What I'm contesting that in uh, in Nagar, you can see the dominant caste, you know so present, so strong, uh, that on the one hand, you have, you know, local officials, uh, you know, building new capacity here at the sub-district level. But on the other hand, the, the very power of the dominant caste is intact, and that's really affected the performance of NRG here. And Bihar again, you know, despite Nitish Kumar's uh, new Naya, B Naya, Naya Bihar, and et cetera, et cetera. And this is a place which is also by dominated by Maoist and Marxists. So I come to here, uh, you know. Uh, Thank I, I, Ashwini, I know you have so much more. Actually, Rahul is just going to also put the link to the papers. Um, just last, 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 last word, last sure, word. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I mean like. Uh, yeah. uh, so the last word is here, you know, and concluding is for me, understanding the welfare regimes or, uh, or welfare outcomes at the sub-national level is, is, is important in the sense of politicization of redistributive struggles. That's what I'm trying to suggest. That welfare happens only, only when you build sufficient, sufficient, sufficient associational capacity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry for having no, that's uh, it, that's rushed it. you in. I know the feeling when you're just trying to explain six districts and uh, <laughs> all the field work. Uh, so, you know, thank you very much. Um, shall we, if, yeah, if you can. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. perfect, great. Uh, so if I can invite Louise and, and Roger back and then we can open this up to a conversation. We did start a few minutes late, so hopefully uh, everyone can stick around for just an extra few minutes in case we run over. Um, but thank you all so much. And I think, uh, you know, this is a point, Ashwini, that you mentioned, and I think uh, everybody's comments have talked about it. Often we think about state capacity as static or as a fixed endowment. And I think a lot of the work that all of you have talked about is to think about it more processually and as something, as work in progress. Uh, I think this panel has also showed us that scholars of state capacity or the state uh, and welfare are also works in progress. Uh, and so I think all of you have referred to 
positions that have changed, frameworks that have evolved, even over a space of a few years. I think, Louise, just how you've opened it up and brought in other dimensions of thinking about how to categorize and think about welfare regimes. I think bringing different methods into conversation, different time periods, historical uh, perspectives and analysis into this, the importance of field work and field insights uh, in conversation with other kinds of data. And I think for us, this is really important because um, these are ongoing conversations and uh, I think our own thinking evolves. And so in some senses, the questions I'm going to pose are also maybe going to ask some of you to think about uh, this evolution and where you are right now and what are the questions in your mind as you might think about future work or the questions that are really at stake. There are also a number of questions coming in, so I will try and uh, pull those in, uh, into the conversation. But let me begin, uh, Luis, actually just, you know, one thing that I found so interesting in your um, framework was this idea of commodification and the market, so protection from the market, and particularly you're thinking about labor markets and commodification of labor, but, uh, and then the familial, <clears throat> and only one of those three had familial in there, right? So defamilializing was an important part of thinking about welfare regimes as well. Um, and so it's decommodification, defamilialization, and welfare, I suppose, would be the where you want to land up, right? Protected from the market, also actually opening people up from the home and allowing them to engage without the family becoming a constraint, and then actual welfare and, and protection. So, you know, it, it struck me that's quite hard, like to think through the indicators and particularly um, what that means that, you know, it's familial and there's no defamilialization anywhere in this zone, not surprising, particularly for those of us who study kinship and in India, uh, but it, it is something that, you know, for you to think, just to have your thoughts on, but also on the commodification, because you're really thinking about it, it in terms of like labor formalization as decommodification in a sense, which is also kind of interesting and counterintuitive. Because in another logic, actually, formalization of labor would also be a form of commodifying labor, right? So is informal labor less commodified than formal labor? Like it's, and it could just be a way words are termed, but it strikes me as counterintuitive to think of formalization as a process of decommodification. Um, and that also makes me think about the other piece of work that has really shaped how we think about Indian states, which is the political economy of crony capitalism and capital state relations, um, which actually often involve a fair degree of formalization as well, and another set of relations that happen, right? It could be formal or informal. But what you see in, in many of the debates on Indian welfare, and particularly, I think, in states like Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, where you, Orissa too, where you have a high degree of extraction and a good degree of extractive industries, the question has always been, does welfare go along with it, right? That in fact, you would expect to see these two go together um, quite rationally in terms of, a, if you think about it from the point of view of the state, right? And so arguments that they are not two separate sides or a contestation, but quite consistent with the way in which these states are being shaped. And so I was curious whether you think this is in some senses the best you get, right? Is that what you, you know, that this is, it's a highly informal state. It's an economy which is highly informal. There will be contestation, but you are seeing protection. So you're not seeing that it's, it's not missing, but that rather than starting to see these as contradictory, uh, they perhaps are not. And, and, you know, given the cluster of states in your work that come into this commodifying but protective, um, and that there are, an, you know, a larger number of them there, uh, what you make of that? And it'd be really interesting to hear, um, you know, Ashwini and, and Roger, if you have something to think through about the framework itself, and particularly on this question of commodification, I think. So that was just one in, in the framing question, and then we can go forward from there. Should I come in now? Sure, I mean, or I could ask, you know, the, the other two, and then actually all of you could reflect on those. I mean, if that's better. So the second uh, piece that I had actually, and I think Louise, you would have quite a lot to say about this as well, is actually thinking about the federal question and center state relations. Uh, and one of the things that I already mentioned uh, 
in that, uh, you know, after listening to Roger's presentation was about, um, you know, what kinds of arrangements then do you do where the state has to play this role? It is a convening role, it is a coordinating role, but it's not about bypassing the states, right? And the kinds of councils that have been put in place in the past have actually not worked so much in terms of bringing the state voice, and it's always about the central policy imagination rather than states bottom up. And, and Roger, at the end of your paper, you mention, uh, you know, a very interesting observation, and I think some of Louise's work has also really talked about this, that in some ways, a lot of the ideas that the center scales up, even in the case of NRHM, and you mentioned the Mitanin program in Chhattisgarh and community health workers or health insurance come from the states. So although the states are missing, the actual engines of innovation and the ideas, and this we are seeing in many of the, you know, one nation, one intervention or one strategy um, approach, the original idea actually comes from state innovation. Um, but then it's taken up at the central level and scaled and often the state that originally came up with it resists joining the scale up and says, oh, we'll do our own thing. This happened, I mean, in the case of agriculture markets, this has happened with Karnataka, which was the original one that actually did all this interlinking of mandis and then did not join the ENAM in the initial phases. So, you know, that tension between actually the states being the innovators, the site of innovation, and all the good ideas actually do eventually come from the states, but then it's about the states are ineffective and so the center will take them and it's often an idea that fits one state, rather than allowing the states that actual genuine autonomy where the center plays a coordination function but then empowers the state. So that, you know, just how does one rethink that and, and, and work through. Um, and then finally, Ashwini, we'll come, you know, do you, I think it's really important to refocus on the districts also and to think about the local as a site for not just capacity, but contestation and political change. So not just thinking about it from the top up in terms of political decisions led by chief ministers or major political parties or bureaucrats, but you know, to think through this. Uh, but I wonder how much, you know, this recent survey that we did of IAS officers in COVID, uh, and this is a final question, you know, which is interesting, the state itself is categorizing states, right? So Niti Aayog uses this SDG index. And of course, nobody does badly. So there are aspirants and performers, and then front runners and achievers. India has no achievers uh, in the last round, at least now then we may have some. But um, in 2018, there were just aspirants, performers, and uh, um, you know, front runners. Uh, and we but we used this to actually divide up uh, the, uh, you know, and, and to, disaggregate some of the responses of IS officers. And there was significant difference between, say, front runner states, and you would be here thinking here of Kerala, Tamil Nadu, um, Himachal, um, and the amount that they focused on, say, planning, or feeling that you should have planned rather than locked down, or that it, public cooperation is more important than coercion, right? You saw significant differences in among states. You be Bihar, much more the sense that it's coercion rather than cooperation, eventually when it comes to why did the public comply, right? And, and we'll share this report as well on the chat for those of you who are interested in taking a look at it. Um, and it so strikes me how much does then the state itself, right? Also shape, not just the autonomy of the frontline, but across the bureaucracy. And it was interesting to see which were the officers who had more faith in their frontline as well, right? And so that there seem to be some kind of state norms and values in the bureaucracy. And I wonder how much of that is Carter specific also and is reflected between, you know, so rather than thinking of it as an entirely autonomous zone or an entirely embedded one, it is about this embedded autonomy, right? That that you're referring to, and that includes other actors, including the district collectors and districts and other sorts of, uh, you know, middle bureaucracy. So the BDOs that you know you mentioned in Yamini's paper and all the rest. So it's not just the front line, uh, in the sense of the functionary, but across the entire thing. So uh, these were few thoughts, um, and I think you'll all have something to say about all of them. So why don't we get started, and then I'll also weave in some of our audience questions. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you all. 
Shall I, I'll, shall I go first since I, you posed the first question to me? Um, uh, so thank you. Those are really um, big questions, not all of which I can do justice to. But um, just to start where you started with, with you know, the, the, the role of the family and defamiliarization as something kind of new or different that I'm trying to do in this paper. Um, and it is, a, it is what I what I can do here is quite limited, um, partly because of limited data. Um, but also, I think partly because we're only really just starting to see states engaging seriously in policy discussions about what political scientists might describe as, as defamiliarization. So I think in years to come, things like the discussions about wages for housework that were quite you know visible in the recent Tamil Nadu state elections for instance um, of course you know West Bengal has also invested quite a lot in gender-based social policy initiatives so going forward I think there could be some you know, really, a really interesting opportunity to follow on what I'm trying to do here to look much more specifically at social policy through a gender and family lens. I think I'm only dipping my toes in the water in, in what I'm doing here, but um, I felt it was important to recognise that gender dimension because I think it has often been sidelined in the cross-national literature on, on welfare regimes. Um, it's a, and then on to, on to the other kind of pillar, which is, is decommodification. Um, that's a, it's really interesting that you say that formalization seems, it seems counterintuitive to see for, formalization as, as an example of decommodification. Um, and the reason to do so is because formalization itself implies certain kinds of employment rights. Um, so with those come the, you know, the notion that um, a worker has a right to a livelihood and is not simply dependent on market conditions for the fulfillment of that of that livelihood. Um, so, you know, people like Nita Rudra, who would classify India as, a, as, as having had a protectivist impulse in its early kind of welfare regime, describes it also as being quite precocious in that because it was simultaneously introducing decommodifying policies at the moment at which it was still, which labour was still being commodified. Um, and and um, so, you know, that, but, but I think there, I, I mean, it, it makes sense to me to see formalization as a, as a form of, of decommodification because of the, 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 the rights that go with it. Um, and those are being eroded at the moment, but, but that was, you know, that, that was the kind of the, the, the design. Um, and then to your other question about, you know, whether commodification and protection are contradictory or, or whether it's surprising to think they go together. Um, I mean, at one level, you know, we don't see we don't see protection. Fun we don't, we don't see equally effective protection everywhere we see commodification or heavy, you know, kind of um, in, you know, incidents of, of um, very high levels of labour market inf informalization and precarity. Um, and even in those extractive states, of, you know, there are important contrasts between Chhattisgarh and Charkand, for instance. Chhattisgarh and Orissa, I think, are more similar. In you know, in in kind of being places where ex extra, uh, kind of particular kinds of um, political kind of political economy of extraction has gone hand in hand with um, uh, with with an investment in, in in social assistance, but we don't see that everywhere. So I don't think it's a necessary connection, um, but I think it's becoming more common. Um, and of course, you know, there is a, a larger political economy literature. I think of you know. Other tragedies made made a similar point. I mean, it's slightly different, uh, kind of from a slightly different theoretical perspective to my own. But you know, Pathar Chatterjee, Sanyal, you know, the kind of the, the idea that the legitimation of the kind of India's growth strategy has depended on a certain kind of investment in, in social assistance. Um, what I'm what I'm really interested in is how that actually played out at the state level, which states actually invested in turning around their, you know, the, the their their ability and inclination to implement these, you know, 
especially PDS and, and Narega um, in, in this period, um, you know, and, and then kind of what that tells us about the welfare books. Um, so I hope I've, I've answered the main questions there. Great, thanks, thanks. Uh, Roger? Yeah, thanks. Um, a number of, again, great questions and uh, really opened up some very interesting areas. I mean, the, the thing that I think I take away partly from what we've done this afternoon, evening, is again, whether really health and education are part of this discourse. Um, so what you're talking about seems to work for Enrega and for issues of, of social insurance of, of various kinds. But we, I seem to be living in a different world. You talk about commodifying health, and we're talking about making it something that you have to pay for, and you have to, um, you know, it doesn't seem to me to be fitting into your model of commodification. So, you know, I find that, I found that quite jarring. I'm, I'm not sure that, that 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 would be really very helpful. And I think uh, Shwani said something about, you know, Enrega, but maybe not other parts of welfare policies. and and. You know, it, it doesn't seem to me that the literature that, or even you know, what we've talked about today, can really talk about a coherent set of issues that that flow across all these different parts of social welfare as we tended to understand it. And I don't think I'm competent to un to explain why that might be or what its problems are. And um, but again, the defamiliarization of health. Um, you know, if we we're talking about the role of gender of kinship relations and so on and again we've got a very strong literature deriving from um, Tim Dyson and Mick Moore about gender-based systems of kinship and their differences across India which you know it's de generated all sorts of, of, of issues but it this would fit in in some ways to this discussion of trying to understand how kinship systems affect I mean obviously in the work that I know about who becomes an usher or a, um, an Anganwadi worker and what kind of impact they're likely to have, whether they're a local girl or somebody who's married in from a distance. Um, et cetera, you're quite apart from issues of caste and everything else. So that was my first sense that this, you know, this is my putting up my flag for health. Let's, let's remember the health area. It's not quite the same. It doesn't seem to fit yeah. in. No, Roger, if I can just actually just take off from what you've said, because Priyadarshini Singh has made a similar point about education and, you know, whether it's individual bureaucrats, but really how much does it, or individual politicians, how much does it drive systemic reform? And I think what you're pointing out is that in a framework, actually, you can't even think about defamiliarization going along with a commodification because it's the family firm. And labor is also often highly, you know, part of family systems. And, you know, so Barbara Harris White's work and others will show you this very clearly. It's part of the social structure of accumulation in the informal economy. But if you see it as formalization and decommodification, then the familialization may go along with formal sector employment, where women set up, you know, set out to work in factories and stuff to some extent, more than you would see it in the informal economy in some ways. So you're asking in health and in education where the family is so crucial in the production of outcomes, uh, whether either defamiliarization works or um, you know, this idea of come on, can it really work? I think it's a really important question. And therefore is our debate about subnational welfare regimes just missing health? Like our health and education not in the welfare space? Um, uh, and, and it's an interesting question, like, is India getting what it puts in the welfare space? I mean, in another sense, I always argue that agriculture is treated as a welfare sector when it's part of the economy. And maybe health and education should be treated as welfare sectors, but they're not at all. Uh, and in fact, don't become part of the schemes and acts in the same way. So sorry to interrupt, but I think that's actually a really important kind of direction for us to push a little. Yeah, I, th I think it, it would be. I think that there's all sorts of issues. And certainly there are indicators that Louise and, and others could use in terms of, you know, quite amazing statistics that I came across quite recently about the level of production of doctors in different parts of the country and how the South is overproducing relative to the North, as you might imagine, for all sorts of reasons. But the doctors tend to stay, you know, don't, don't travel very far. So, so these are you know, again, processes of, of exacerbating social divisions rather than, than um, talking in terms of a national doctor shortage or anything else. I, just briefly, on the other points you made, um, 
Yes, I think that the, the, your, your point about the states often being the engines of innovation, or at least that they innovate in certain sorts of ways, I think the, the central government has a real problem, and I, I've, I've seen this in, in, in lots of, of ways. It wants to produce a program that can apply without variation in every district in the country. And its ability to allow for variation on the basis of local variations is quite limited. I'm not saying this is blinkered and completely takes no notice, but the kinds of things that get taken into account are things like um, you know, nor northeastern states or mountainous states. Or, you know, there, there are exceptions allowed, but they don't in any sense come to terms with the variations within, within allow a, a familiarity with the local district as the, an issue that might allow you to spend your money differently. And that's, that was one of the things they tried to do in the National Rural Health Mission. And, and it really, I, I think, you know, one of the readers of the art, my article said, these district health societies really didn't take off and in large parts of the country. You can't jump across, you can't keep the state level out of things like health and education. They, they have to be in some sense part of the structure, partly because people get transferred and so on. So I think you're right that when they're scaled up, they become a, a different body and a different kind of thing. And states suddenly think, well, we don't want to be part of this, even though we, we're doing the same sort of thing ourselves partly because of this sense, I think, that they're going to be straight jacketed. And the other thing about health and to some extent education is that states are not the only source of engines of innovation, it's the international sphere. So health in particular is continually being pushed by external advisors, by doctors who've trained abroad or who are part of a WHO network to take on ideas that have come from elsewhere. So there's this kind of tension between, you know, is the state going to do what um, Lincoln Chen and um, the people from Columbia University want, or are they going to do what makes more sense politically? Um, and finally, just this idea of the local, I think, yes, I mean, the, I, I'm not sure if we can go as far as the district, but um, I mean, districts show an awful lot of interesting things, but anybody in Harit Prasad, in Harit Pradesh would, would tell you that we aren't the same as Bundelkhand or, you know, the state, the size of UP, you can't talk about this as a single entity, I think. Um, and I, I think it's a very valid point to keep pushing that home, that, that local variations within districts and between districts in a particular state have also somehow or other to be taken into account. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> Ashwin. Uh, Mekla, I mean, like once again, summarizing what I said and also responding to some of the questions uh, I saw in the chat box, uh, you know, uh, what I'm suggesting here, like degree of democracy, in, we need to really reconceptualize degree of welfare in India. I mean, like, there is not uniform welfare. There is not even welfare, you know, even in the state clusters, you know, I guess, uh, you know, Lewis has done fantastic exceptional work on that. Uh, so it's familiar. What I'm trying to suggest here that if you look at the design, you know, uh, of NRG or design of the welfare, when we hit the ground, you know, and we are with the people, you know, pre-COVID, I was in Chatra district, Chatra district of Tarkand, you know, it's a very notorious place, you know, Naxals and everyone. I mean, Naxals, I'm looking at in terms of the people. So what I'm suggesting that, you know, it's also called, welfare is also perceived by the people, you know, as paperwork. You know. I mean, unless it is implemented. If it is not implemented and in the district, at the block level or the GP, it doesn't reach the village. But every day I go to the go to the site morning. If it doesn't happen, it becomes a paperwork. You know, it becomes another form of genocide. You know, silent genocide. People suffer. You know, so that's my that's that's why I'm looking at uh, not just degree of democracy, but also degree of welfare in terms of heterogeneous outcomes of welfare in various parts of the country. Two, uh, I've also you know failed to mention in my uh, you know seemingly little longest presentation uh, uh, about. Uh, you know, the, the very, the, look at, you know, I mean, like a Jalpai Guri case, you know. In the Jalpai Guri case is interesting for both my co-panelists, uh, uh, and they have done fantastic work on welfare, that, that that the whole tea garden, the whole social democratic regime, you know. And when you come here, you find NRGA, I have written in the paper and made it very clear, NRGA, you know, when I, the innovation happened at the district level, not even at the state level, you know. In fact, uh, 
uh, I just don't, don't want to get into the trouble with the government, current government, you know, so I would be, you know, non-official, but off the record, uh, we, we confronted a situation, uh, you know, uh, that it is illegal to extend an RGA without, you know, approval of the central government, you know, I said, see, whether it's this regime or that regime, you know, but as part of the guidelines, there was no provision for extending an RGA to the tea gardens, you know, where people are suffering, you know, there are, there are starvation cases, there are other cases happening, you know, so, so the district innovated, the district innovated, and then sent it back to the state level. And the state level sent it to us, you know, in the committee that, can you come and see? Can you legalize it? Can you legalize this provision? So this is like a big paradox, you know, that here, you know, chunk of officials, you know, uh, you know, just, and these officials are not operating because of their own whims and fancies or some sort of cognitive maps we read, read on a state literature, organization literature. They were confronting a very powerful set of union leaders and also right to food campaign, you know. They were facing trouble, you know, in the Supreme Court, you know. So you look at this complex environment, you know, in which complex environment, they, that collector and officials and the and the videos picked up only NRG, only NRG, interestingly. And I traveled, you know, I went one, from one side to another side, no help, no PDS, you know, you know, home, you know, like go to, you know, the village after village on the plantation and there was nothing to eat. Only on the plantation, you know, when Narega was implemented, suddenly they started getting food, they started getting income. So what I'm trying to suggest here, here is a very, very different and unique, uh, you know, environment, uh, political environment. In this political environment, what I suggest that labor was not, labor was not demobilized, you know, labor was mobilized. You know. So welfare happens, my large point, only on such conditions, where it is not captured by either local officials or local politicians, when level is mobilized through politicization. And welfare can happen, I assert. If you look at my paper, you know, I have mentioned it, Bagal Code, a good case, you know, good modest performance of NRGA, but labor was demobilized, you know, because of the clientelistic practices. So I stop here, you know. Yeah, no, but actually, you know, I think you also push us to think about, again, I think it's also the point Roger made about RD is different, right? So is NREGA by its design? It's a demand-driven scheme. It was very unique in its design, even different from, say, PDS. And one of the striking things about the last, uh, you know, year with COVID where PDS and NREGA have been the mainstays of government response and relief, that the PDS is not designed as a demand-driven program. So inclusion was much harder to achieve with something like PDS than with NREGS design. So one thing that's interesting there, and this is something we find happens repeatedly in health, for example, even with the Mithanin program or with community health workers, that when you need institutional change at multiple levels to get the system to reform, that institutional reform is quite difficult to achieve after a certain point. And this is when people start talking about low hanging fruit, right? Uh, or even something like social audits and all the work on accountability has also shown that it's effective in some areas, but if the system is simply not able to respond, and this is one place where even health workers become very vulnerable because if the health system doesn't reform, it becomes quite hard for them to provide certain kinds of services. And then they become actually the objects of all kinds of, um, you know, uh, public attacks, you know, they become quite vulnerable as workers as well. So it's very difficult, you know, this demand mobilization site of politicization without change. And I think this is, you know, Priyadarshini Singh was one of our colleagues at, has, has raised this question. And I'll, I'll, two questions that from the audience, which I think we'll throw back at you to wrap up the discussion uh, is about individual reformers. So in her work on elementary education reform, she's finding important parallels with health in terms of the state level and, and um, you know, political and bureaucratic commitment. But what she's seen is that there's a lot of a role of individual politicians and bureaucrats who've been personally committed to elementary education, whether it's Narasimha Rao in Andhra Pradesh, an MP Vijay Kumar in Tamil Nadu. Um, and this also happens at the national level with bureaucrats. Uh, and does that also happen a lot with health, but does this really push reform and improve health outcomes? And this is the system tension, right? Oh, I'm sorry for the, the sound effects uh, from the other room, uh, the other side of our lockdown lives. Um, but the other um, 
question, and I think this is a nice one to draw this conversation to a close, is that you know some argue that India is a case of centripetal federalism with no genuine autonomy at the subnational level. Uh, but from the work that all of you have presented, it seems that at least in the context of the welfare state, the claim of India being a centripetal federalism may not hold. And that, in fact, there is space not only at the state level, but as Ashuni is pointing out, also at the district level, certainly for a, a certain kind of sphere of action to, to take place. So I think this tension of, you know, how do we think about these sites and how do we think about institutional arrangements? Certainly our challenge at the State Capacity Initiative is all these layers. Uh, and, you know, you can begin at the begin at the top or the bottom, you run into the problem at both ends. Um, and so, you know, getting that architecture and, as you say, Ashwin, the politics at all levels, right? So um, I'll turn to you both this question on centripetal federalism and then individuals versus uh, and systems and reform. You could take it in any order that you like, but otherwise, Louise, you can start. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, to break up the conversation, we should probably probably go with Roger so that it actually yeah, seems yeah. like a conversation and not like a circle that we're going around, but <laughs> whichever way. Roger, Roger, I don't Roger. mind. You... Roger, Roger, Roger. Yes, Roger, you go. Roger, I'm going to go the other way around. Slowly. Roger, Ashwini, and Louise to bring us to a close. Okay. So I think, I mean, yes, of course, I think education has more examples of, of it, you know, striking individuals who really made a difference and, and are really put their back into, into making changes. What I was, so far as I've got an answer, I think it would also say that there are certain contexts, certain periods when it's possible for for such people to make a difference beyond a local difference so you can certainly find i mean there's great study of um plague in surat and how it changed the whole way in which public health in surat um, worked as a result of the kinds of you know, bringing in different people who who really took health public health issues seriously there um but if you want to look at a more national level changes. What's interesting is I think the Junta government of 77 to 79 in health, um, where Michael Ramalinga Swami, who was boss of the All India Institute at the time, then became, you know, became a real uh, entrepreneur, a health entrepreneur for change in um, the way in which health was delivered. So this is the time for community health workers for um, uh, you know, a radical shift in the in the way in which local level health work was carried on, but it doesn't last. That's the problem, I think. Um, very soon after that, one gets a fight back so that the community health workers, you know, in order to stop them becoming, wanting to become regular cadre, for example, so they, they shouldn't be paid so much. And I think the first UPA government is another period of, of innovation when, you know, very important people within health and in education um, really got to grips with, with trying to make a change. And I, I think I think the problem is the, the the institutionalizing of these changes rather than the fact that people you don't have people willing to make those choices. You do. You have excellent I mean, in every country, excellent people who, who see the, the, the problems and build towards a solution. But how you sustain that and deepen it is the problem. So you get it. It works at, at, level, at different levels. Um, I can leave the centripetal question to the rest. Uh, uh, Metla, I would agree with uh, I would agree with Roger that this the whole conventional way of looking at Indian federal system, either from the lens of centripetal and centrifugal, it doesn't matter. It doesn't doesn't work. You know? I mean, like, based on my ten years of you know work across twenty two states, uh, you know you know some fifty districts, uh, you know what I would like to suggest here, I just suggest here and share with my. Uh, Panel, co panelist here that seems like seems like you know good you know i wanted to address uh, tilin also because at least uh, rather than you know centripetal and centrifugal there are concentric circles in india concentric circles in india innovations are happening not just in the in delhi or iic or cpr innovations are actually happening uh, happening you know in a very small village you know you know, participating in a social audit meet meeting in Chhattisgarh, in Chhattisgarh, in Chhatra district, you know, despite all the impression, all the perception of it, an Axel area, if it is an Axel area, if it is an opium growing area, if it is a predatory area, oh, how NRGA every day happening, you know, 
how innovations are happening here. So I think we need to, you know, set aside, you know, this whole issue of centripetal or centrifugal and look at as Tillin rightly point out either clusters or concentric circles, you know, because that's very important uh, for us to understand. And and then finally, uh, finally, uh, um, I'm, uh, you know, um, now I've got more energy, you know, despite having worked 10 hours as dean of the school, and I'm getting more energy back to me. What I did, you know, and we did rather, you know, concluding here, and I, I'm, I'm leaving a question here, I'm, I'm leaving a thought here, and which is a bit based on based on the experience of implementing, a, you know, welfare programs in the country. Does communitization and relates to make your, your work, uh, state capacity, uh, does communitization help us to build new state capacity at the subnational level? By communitization, I mean, you know, linking both associational capacity and, and the so called state capacity. Because in the same district, when I went after two years, Narega was floundering, you know, because the new collector was interested in education. You know. The new political regime was interested in something else, you know. And then worker was demobilized, you know, because workers who were mobilized in NRGA, in NRGA, they posed a challenge, they posed a threat, a political threat to the regime in power at the district level. So we are forgetting that these are multiple actors, you know. So the best thing that could happen from my point of view and where Indian state, particularly as at the subnational level, regain their capacity, build more capacity only through communitization of so-called state apparatus, you know, not in the sense of extractive and coercive capacity. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ashwin. Louise. Sorry, I have my own childcare intrusions coming in as well. <laughs> in fact, I thought it was my children <laughs> noise from my house, Michael, and not yours earlier. So <laughs> it might have been. <laughs> but um, no, I, I just, I mean, in a, in a way, I wanted just to, to kind of say how much I agree with Ashwani about the, the importance of innovation that the, the pockets of innovation that happen in welfare implementation happen in many spaces. Um, my work has been, I suppose, particularly inspired by just trying to understand the, the state, state level as a space for innovation, because I think for a long time, it hasn't been seen as a space for policy innovation, it's been seen as a space for variegated implementation, but I'm, you know, I'm also interested in the, in the ideas that, that, that kind of take hold at the state level. Um, but I, you know, I absolutely agree with you, and in my own field work also have come across what have felt to seem to be the most surprising instances of very strongly held ideas and convictions shaping local innovation. Um, and also, you know, to Roger's point, the, the different streams of influence as well um, that, 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 you know, that play a role there. Um, international, you know, I mean, I'm, I remember sitting in the, the NIC office in, in, in Chhattisgarh, which was the most kind of unpre, I mean, it was the most surprising place to see kind of computing innovation happening in terms of welfare delivery, but also, you know, um, the kind of the brandishing of ideas that were underpinning the, the innovation that, that they, you know, the, the, that was happening in terms of PDS delivery so you know I, I kind of I, I absolutely agree with you that that we should think about this in a kind of you know in a in a more complicated way rather than top down or you know or bottom up um I also just wanted to come back to Roger's point on on where health fits in to the the kind of the, the I mean my own work but also the work of many other people on the kind of subnational politics of welfare um, and indeed the national politics of welfare. <laughs> and, I, and I have to absolutely agree with you, I think, that it doesn't fit well at the moment. It's not really very present in my own paper, partly because I wanted to include data on um, in kind of what we might describe as health commodification. So reliance on, on out-of-pocket health expenditure or, or um, you know, pr proportion of births that took place in, in public hospitals and so on. But there are so many gaps in the data across states that I that I couldn't that I just couldn't use that bring that data in. But um, in in other work, I am starting to to get more deeply into trying to understand the politics of health and, in a sense, the absence of a politics of health, um, which I think you know stems in part from the lack of confidence that. And to go to to Priyadarshini's question about individual leaders. The, the lack of confidence that individual 
politicians and and possibly bureaucrats have in the in the kind of possibility of, of health, health sector reforms and the the visibility of those reforms as a kind of as, a, as an electoral good um, I think those are much harder questions to crack in the health sector than they are in the kinds of more distributive policies um, that you know that, that we've highlighted in terms of you know so Narega PDS, but also you know a much wider set of, of kind of more distributive welfare schemes. So I do think health sits in a peculiar place. Probably education too, um, uh, you know, for, for for some of those reasons, but, but probably others too. Um, thank you so much. I mean, I think we've already uh, gone way past time. Um, and so uh, to thank all of you for, you know, so generously giving of your time and your ideas, um, and also everybody who's stayed and participated uh, through the discussion. But I think we can already sense that we're just scratching the surface. And I think one of the most important things, and, and this, we're really hoping that the State Capacity Initiative can become a space where we think about with both an imagination, a political imagination, uh, and, but a ground, you know, and a grounded conceptual framework that is empirically rich, that is deeply engaged with the ground, but at the same time is imaginative and, and does look at things afresh and in a different way. And I think one of the things you've also pushed us to think about is not innovation and as just pockets of innovation as isolated but as part of systems. And so, I mean, in an, as an anthropologist, we always say, right, that you can take big principles away from single sites. There are things that you can do. You don't, it's not always about how you can compare, it is what you compare. And sometimes what you're taking away are relationships that then obtain elsewhere as well. Relationships between expertise and implementation, relationships between society, politics, and state capacity, relationships that you then can see elsewhere so that you can think in a generative way about state capacity, uh, not as an endowment or something static, but that is constantly moving and being built. And I think this conversation has pushed us to think about a range of relationships, uh, even the relationships between labor and family or decommodification, the economy, pushing us to think about health and NREGA or health versus NREGA and how they are different. So I think it, it's been a really rich and generative uh, conversation. Um, you know, thank you all. And I hope we can have you back, uh, you know, to, to go in deeper to everybody who's still here. We have uh, the three papers as well as, um, the paper that we've done on the survey with IS officers on COVID, the pandemic and public administration in the chat box in case you'd like to uh, download those and take a look. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to having you back at CPR virtually, physically, all very soon. So thank you all very much uh, and, good, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yes. you very much, Roger. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for yeah. organizing this and for doing yes. it so well. And, and thank you to my colleague Rahul, who I think Ashwini's already mentioned, whose brilliant idea it was to get everybody together and in very short notice, and, and to uh, colleagues who have made sure that. Uh, Mekla also, as a, I yes. and Mekla also finally, as a dean, I also invite all of you to TISS, you know, <laughs> virtually and physically. Thank you very much. Physically, I hope, before much before <laughs> too long. <laughs> we will do it physically. We will do it physically. All of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.